up here. I have two short comments in response to the presentation, and then of course I want to open it to the panel for their thoughts as well. Uh, the first is my comment, the second comes from one of the uh, questions from the previous session which relate to this topic. And my first comment is you, you referenced the term of a minor pogrom. And I think that works like surgery. A minor pogrom is something that happens to somebody else. <laughs> and I think... But there I, are major ones, too. There are, uh, <laughs> certainly, 4,000 people is nothing. It's not nothing. And, that um, the case, Right, right. And, and I think that the, the challenge for us is, as you highlighted so ably in your presentation, there's more to survival than just physical survival. You know, there's the sense of honor and dignity that we take so for granted in some ways in our experience that was not the case for Jews living as the Dini in Muslim lands. And on that topic, a question from the previous session that I'd like to direct to you and obviously get the feedback of the uh, panel is, were there any identifiable factors that determined why the Pact of Lamar was interpreted more or less strictly, more or less discriminatorily in different areas at different times? Is there anything we can identify that can provide a pattern, or is it simply it was different in a lot of places? Good question. <laughs> uh, I'd say it's tricky methodologically to, to look after the fact and then say, uh huh, these were the conditions. Decline, religious, um, the Jews, the, it, superseding or exceeding the bounds that they were supposed to follow, economic crisis, drought, all the other conditions that enabled often the religious reformer to come in to berate the administrator. As I look at examples, say, of the al which was a vast and um, very, very brutal chapter in the 12th century of uh, Jewish life in which a strictly, fiercely fundamentalist dynasty swept out of the Sahara Berber dynasty and uh, really left a trail of blood in, in, in Morocco and uh, Algeria and Muslim Spain. This is when, by the way, the Jews flee Muslim Spain and took Christian Spain. It's aberrant. It existed partly having initially not that much to do with the Jews. The context was the Reconquista, the Reconquest going on in Spain, the fall of the city of Toledo in 1085 to the Christians, the triumphalism. Remember that history was the working out of the will of God. For a triumphant people, where God, history, and God's will seem to be um, in tandem, there is an outrage to reverses that are um, both uh, very conspicuous and also very, very traumatic and uh, inexplicable. The 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 thing that I try to suggest is that the pact was always there. The agreement, whatever it was called, it's sometimes called the Pact of Umar, it's sometimes called other things, depending upon the documents. But the notion of place, the notion of face, the notion of sovereignty, because it, of where it, the sovereignty, this Jew could not be in a position of authority over a Muslim. And these are very troubling precedents in terms of um, trying to explain today, is there a possibility theologically for a sovereign Jewish state in, in uh, its citizenship uh, being uh, in the, to a good percentage of Muslim? Is that, and Muslims have talked about, and the, the jurors certainly in the 15th century as of today, talked about what are the issues, which I mean, you'll help me much more with that, of um, Muslims living in Christian society. What are the parameters of living in a state of the unbeliever or the, the non-Muslim? The non I, I know that literature from Morocco, which I 
there are certainly an ongoing questions uh, today. So the conditions might be local, but the um, dilemma was almost timeless. Great. Could have, please, uh, can you <coughs> pass the mic on? I'd like to make what uh, may be called an observation which follows out of your lecture, but it's not, wasn't mentioned there, rightly so. Uh, and it applies not only to the Muslim world, it applies, for, for, applies to the Christian world as well. For a very, very long period of history, the Jews were subjected to indignities, humiliation, and so on and so forth, and oppression. Why did they maintain their separate? It was so easy in the Muslim world to become Muslim. All you had to do was to go out of uh, the later period of the Mela or wherever it was and uh, convert, and that was that. Contrary to the uh, to, to Christian Europe, it was um, not followed usually by any kind of recriminations about your past. It was so easy. Now. I have a thought about that. I've had it for a long period of time, and um, I think, you know, there is something in Jewish theology that made it possible for Jews to have a feeling of superiority. Because if they behave the right way, and every Jew, of course, uh, who was brought up in uh, the atmosphere of religious Judaism, knew what was right, to observe the uh, uh, 613 commandments, or as many of them as possible. What would that bring? That would influence God. The only people in the world that could actually determine history were the Jews, because they could influence God, and then God would do what the Jews asked him to do. And there was a very strong feeling and you, you, when you read rabbinical literature, when you read mis Jewish mysticism and all that sort of stuff, you find that this is a way out. In actual fact, we are the rulers. The others just don't know it. <laughs> it was a, 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 a social psychological reaction. It was never uttered in the way that I am uttering it now. But it certainly is there as far as I can see. And I think that in order to ex you see, you, you said the Christians fled. Now the cops didn't flee. And the Assyrians didn't flee. I didn't study that, so I can't I can't answer that. Huh? Not that. No, that. But you know, in the place that uh, Shalom's ancestors come from. When the Spanish Jews came, they were called Signores Francos. The old established Syrian Jews, the Romagnotes, or the equivalent of the Romagnotes in Syria, were called Signores Viejos. Both shared this same kind of attitude. We are really the people who determine this. As a, as a corollary, as a corollary and, and a way uh, interpretive question coming out of that comment, one of the questions from the audience was, was there a continuing discrimination against Jews once they had converted to Islam? We may know in Muslim, uh, in the Christian part of Spain, there, an idea arose certainly after the Inquisition and the expulsion of this idea of the Dies de Sandra, if you had to go back and check the pedigree to see if someone was really Christian or just a new Christian. Um, and the question is if something like that also uh, obtained in the world of Islam. Uh, it, it's an interesting phenomenon that, and this is also what you take in both um, Christendom and under Islam, is that an individual Jew can pass. A community tends to, uh, if there is a communal conversion, or forced conversion. Uh, there are lots of proverbs uh, about the, the racial equality, the you can go to the 
40th generation, and there's still a Jew, even though, and you can see it in the phone books. Look at El Cohen's in the phone book of affairs today. El Cohen, the, the uh, Muslims have been Muslims since the 12th century. And again, at the time of the setting up of the ghetto in Morocco in 1438, uh, there were many conversions, and those, when they, when they came as a massive, which was the case in Spain, then because Judaism is not just a dogma, but there's an ethnic and a, other social factors involved, the distinction in the mind of the majority remains that there are still Jews. And of course, you all know the jokes that in this country, even the individuals, that still remembered, um, you know, that Mr. Smith or Mr. You know, it, it isn't the form of Mr. Goldberg or the form of Mr. Cohen that you're looking for. Which one? So you know, this sort of um, understanding that the the Jew is still in the minds of others a Jew. Uh, Yehuda's comment. Um, I would put it in, a, in some ways in a, a little bit of a different frame, uh, and that is not the sense of we are the right, you know, that we are the chosen, but that we chose what we what we have been socialized to believe is a message that is whole and positive and good, and has the wisdom in it of the ages, uh, that the history of the Jews, though, has been a history of waiting, and not always patiently. And so there were those who broke out of that impatience in the first century, of course, we know the most famous cases, but in other centuries as well. It tended, though, more to be either the messianic um, kind of cry, scream of, of pushing the end of days, than the uh, departure. But then there are lots of cases of conversions to Islam and conversions to Christianity, not of all, not all of which were um, under coercion. It's odd for God to choose the Jews. Yeah. It's not so odd, the Jews chose God. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lassie. I wonder if I can amplify somewhat on Professor Bauer's question and, and James <coughs> We really know very little about the social dynamics of conversion in the Islamic world, uh, much less so about the social dynamics of conversion of Jews and of Christians. We're living in a very different kind of society. This is not the United States of America where you can come to New York City from someplace else uh, and if you speak uh, with a proper accent, get rhinoplasty and you go to the Church of St. John the Divine and enroll yourself as a member, become a practitioner, change your name, and eventually join the cabinet of the United States government. <laughs> We're dealing here with a very there are no individuals. People live in, 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 in societies, multiple societies, in particular communities, and sub communities, and sub communities within sub communities. The individual is at risk. The individual's life is licit in tribal societies. The individual is at social and economic and at moral risk under any circumstances. So Jews really could not easily convert because they had no society to move into as a result of this particular kind of conversion. And what is interesting is uh, speculating about this uh, because uh, one of the questions that I've always been very much intrigued about in, in studying the Islamic literature between Jews and Muslims is the wide variety of, of Arabic texts that do exist, which could give rise to all sorts of very, very anti-Jewish sentiments. But it is perfectly clear that the, the traditional Muslim writers who, who read these particular texts and these traditions don't draw those particular conclusions. And the question is, why don't they draw those particular conclusions? And the answer for me was that, that these texts were created essentially by Jewish converts to Islam. The purpose here was not to demonstrate, unlike Jewish converts to Christianity, uh, that they had found a new and true religion, but rather to point out that Judaism and Islam were really essentially the same religion. These were reverse sides of the same coin. They, they brought the message that, that the quintessence of monotheism was really Islam. And the difference is really in Jewish practice 
right, and Muslim practice were much more understandable to Jews than the differences between Christian practice and, 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 and Jewish practice. Uh, the Quran has a, a wonderful expression there when Muhammad uh, says that the, the laws of Kashmir were uh, punishment which was uh, brought upon the Jews for their sins in the past by God. Now anybody who, who has a kosher home and who, who observes Passover and has to go find a liquid detergent which at the same time is both ritually clean and can still clean the dish, understands very well what he's talking about uh, on, on that particular occasion. The point is that there are things that only Jews could have understood. And I think there was a dialogue between Jews and, and, and between Jewish converts to Islam. I think they live still in the very same neighborhoods that uh, they were not cast off from the community quite at large, that there was an attempt on their part to try and find some sort of reconciliation. And the end result, of course, was the attempt to rewrite the Jewish tradition in an Islamic mold, which made it unacceptable. And this then becomes part of the Islamic tradition, part of the polemic against Jews as well. The same thing happened in Germany, by the way, when, when Jews converted to, uh, to Christianity in Germany, uh, or let us say in Hungary, never mind in Germany, where it was, uh, it was considered advantageous to do something. So who did they hang out with? Other Jewish converts. Or the Unitarian Church. Yes. <laughs> Jews. 
and the translation into Latino of all sorts of French 17th century classics. Uh, the idea of it was to remold the Jew so that he or she would become a modern person. And it was done in some ways in a heavy-handed fashion. At the same time, it did bring all sorts of new, <coughs> dozens of journals, a new fresh window into Europe, into these communities. Now, the Mizrahi experience and the memory, the question of nostalgia, is very different. Because, in fact, on the eve of when the Jews departed, the Muslim countries, their status or their um, level of affluence or their level of education differed from country to country. In the case of Iraq, Iraqi Jewry, which was predominantly Baghdadi Jewry, was totally, totally Arabicized Jewry that was very, the, I think the Baghdad Philharmonic was all Jewish except for one person. The uh, legal profession, the legal aid, the newspapers, the university, this was heavily because the Jews were middle class in Baghdad as an educated Arabic speaker group. So the nostalgia of a, of a Sasson Zomer, of a Samin Mikhail, of the, and the Iraqi Jews in Israel have been very articulate. They don't call themselves Iraqi, by the way. They are Babylonians. Uh, they have their own yichas that goes back <laughs> long before Muhammad, long before even the kings of you know, the Second Temple. Um, these, and of course, as uh, people all of whom lost their moorings as well as their, their property and everything else in, in the flight, um, you are getting reconstructed histories of how that, in many cases, what, what their status was. But it's clear that you had, it was, I think so many people from 12, 22 countries uh, that were in very different stages of both affluence, of rural versus urban, of those who chose to go to France, those, those who chose to go to Israel. There were all sorts of factors that have shaped their memories. Well, I could add to that by simply saying the Iraqi community was not only from, from Baghdad, there were Iraqi Jews from Basra, and, and also quite a number of Iraqi Jews from areas of Kurdistan where the situation was entirely different. And, uh, essentially, the, these memories, which are now into the third generation of people who have never been to Iraq, mind you, uh, some sort of phantasmagoria about how uh, the, their Muslim neighbors used to go out and buy them bread after Passover and how wonderful this was and, and so forth. You know, they, they managed to forget about the pogrom of Rashid Ali Al-Kirani in 1941 uh, in, in Baghdad as well. But uh, one can expect that because many of these people who came as as uh, significant intellectuals and uh, never quite made it in, in a direct sort of way in Israeli society and the end result is that they have had, but they still literate and, and write and, uh, and complain and fetch. <laughs> well, to forestall any more questioning about lunch, I just want to mention one last uh, idea. Uh, I'm sorry, two, two short ideas to think about coming out of this presentation. Uh, the first is, if you want to really get a sense of what it was like at the Dimmy, you have to picture the Jim Crow sound. If you want something from our recent experience. And the phrase that came up in that time that I think really applies to the Dimmy experience is uppity. You know, that if uh, an African American person in the South was too successful or was exerting too much authority, he was thought to be uppity and needed to be put into his place, whether that was pushing him off the pavement or something much more extreme and violent. And so in some ways, the challenge is in dealing with these uppity Jews who are, in some ways, up turning the apple cart of the way things should be from a least traditional uh, Islamic experience. But the last is more positive note. You may have heard the rule of McDonald's and international war. The story that two countries with the McDonald's in them have never gone to war against each other. I think that the first time that was violated was in the 1990s with the Serbian uh, and NATO interaction. I, I'm not sure if that's exactly true. Now, I know that there is a kosher McDonald's in Jerusalem. I don't know if there's a halal McDonald's anywhere in the Muslim world. But, but the, the example that Jane mentioned from the Middle Ages that I didn't remember from her class, which is my fault and not hers, 
of Muslims and Jews traveling together, certainly in the same trading caravans and working together, having shops next to each other, having professions that were mutually respected. I think that those precedents and shared activities, in the end, in, certainly in North America, where people work together and live together and interact with each other, can again try to create that kind of shared experience that was helpful at times, even in the Muslim world, even in these previous periods. So I want to offer again to Professor Gerber our thanks for her marvelous presentation. Give her a round of applause.